Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us stand on welcome on this Easter morning to our service of Holy Communion. Let us stand as we enjoy these beautiful flowers in the Easter Chapel this morning and sing together our opening hymn, number 357. Jesus Christ is risen today. <laughs> who do the flowers for the absolutely stunning uh, arrangements that they've made. I was just, I saw this and I was blown away, and then I saw that and I was blown away, and then I looked over here and I was, I was just going, wow, wow, wow. So can we give them a little clap and, and thank them for the beautiful work this morning. Very, a lot of work on in that. It's very wonderful, ladies. Hear the word of the Lord from the psalm this morning. I will give thanks to you for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We turn to the prayer book on page one in the green prayer book. And I invite you to join in the second response, the Easter response. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. We pray together the collect for purity as we say, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We declare together the hymn of praise as we say, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, 
only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. Let us turn to the bulletin sheet today for the theme prayer for Easter Sunday. The collect is found in the middle of page one in your bulletin. Please join with me as we pray this prayer together, saying, Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to ask, yes, Ken, can you please just turn on the two center fans? The, the two center fans, it's the two bottom switches on the right. The two center, it's the two bottom switches on the right. Thank you. We will have our first reading this morning, which is read to us by Natty. Thank you. The first reading is taken from Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 43. Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but every nation, everyone who fears him and does not what is right and is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announces. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both to in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God, a judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him and receive forgiveness, forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Maddie. Let us join together in the psalm, as we do from side to side, by whole verse beginning on this side. We say together, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exaltation and victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me, and you have come down my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's day, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and to the Amen. 
The epistle reading this morning is read by Professor Duggan. The epistle reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 1. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn have received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what in turn I had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Professor. Let us stand and sing our gradual hymn number 13, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we ask that we may have eyes to see as John saw, that we may not only see but see and understand and understanding may believe. We also ask that you would hear the cry of our heart and that we will find you faithful in your resurrection power to strengthen us in your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. I don't usually stand up here high and lift it up, but um, because this thing is a bit closer than usual, so I, I feel I need to. So my apologies for that. I never feel quite comfortable up here. Um, well, it's lovely to see uh, so many this morning again, and I, I'm just really blown away by the beauty of the flowers and all the creativity and effort. Not only we have flowers, but we have the, the tomb and the stone is rolled away, and the shroud is there, the shroud of Turin, I believe, it's, uh, still inside the, the tomb. Well, um, I'd like to share with you this morning from the Epistle and the Gospel, the evidence for the resurrection and the implication uh, of the resurrection. The evidence, some of the evidence comes to us from the epistle and the implication comes to us from the gospel. So if you have your bulletin there, you might want to keep it open on page three and four uh, to perhaps re refer sometimes. Or you can just listen, of course. When we look at the epistle this morning, it raises for us a question which many people ask uh, in popular media, in books. Uh, at this time of year, there's always a flurry of magazines and books speculating about what happened to the body of Jesus and whether Jesus was God and whether perhaps 
the stories of his resurrection were, were generated hundreds of years after his birth and then written back, uh, as it were, into the story. And indeed, uh, this is so common on blogs and books and magazines and so on, that there are many in the community who believe that somehow the idea that Jesus had risen from the dead evolved or arose as a kind of myth. It's understandable that people would think that way because that's how most religion works. Um, as, as I often mention, I believe the earliest documents uh, and stories about Gautama Buddha came out about 400 years after his life, which is very, very far uh, in historical terms. And you can well understand that there may have been a lot of myth um, which uh, accrued to his story. Yeah, uh, King, I'm going to ask you to close the door to keep the aircon in so you can use the brick, I think. Yeah, no, close it. Close it, not open it. Close it. Yeah, and you can just put the brick there and keep, thank you. Yeah. I think it helps keep the aircon in. So, so many people have this idea. Um, and there are several reasons why I believe in the resurrection. I, I'm also stirred at this time of year to think about the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the implication of that. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, when I was beginning to be in school and then going to theological college in the 80s, there was a very sort of popular move among theologians um, that, that God was somehow dead and that the stories of the resurrection were symbolic and that he hadn't really risen from the dead and um, that it was just a kind of symbolic rising because the early church very quickly latched onto the symbolism of baptism, going into the water being a dying and coming out being a rising. So uh, in, the, in the 20th century, scholars said, oh, he didn't really die. Um, one, one scholar famously referred to the resurrection as a conjuring trick with bones in a dismissive way as if to say that uh, it was not uh, important, that what was really important was the baptism symbol of dying and rising in ourselves to faith in God. Well, unfortunately for these theologians, the uh, history continues to evolve, the study of history and archaeology, the science of documentary source criticism, where scholars, both secular and religious, study the original documents. Uh, this science has evolved uh, more and more in the last 30, 40 years, uh, and we know more, than, more today than we've ever known about the original documents. And these uh, sciences of archaeology and source criticism uh, have continued to uh, put nails in the coffin of the idea that Jesus didn't rise physically from the dead, because they continue to reinforce for us the discovery and the, or the, the confirmation that the early Christians believed in the resurrection from the very beginning, from the word go. And I'm going to just point out a little bit of this evidence to you here this morning. If you look at your 1 Corinthians chapter 15 on, on page 3, this, um, Paul's letter to the Corinthians predates the Gospels. So the, the epistles are all before the, the, the four Gospels. Um, they were written about uh, 48 to 64 AD. We know this because we can date lots of things through the book of Acts. And then we can, we can hang the epistles on the book of Acts like a clothesline. We can connect the epistles and things that are referred to in the epistles to events in the book of Acts. So therefore we can very accurately determine, or fairly accurately determine, when certain epistles were written. And this is obviously a very scholarly art, but it's done, as I say, by secular as well as Jewish and Christian scholars. And there is not, it's not controversial. Um, so, first of all, Paul's letters were written around, let's say, around 50 to 60. And um, they predate the Gospels. The Gospels were written 20 to 30 to 40 years later. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And the, we know from this passage that Paul is writing here about 50 A.D., and he, he says to them, I would remind you, uh, brothers and sisters, of the good news I proclaim to you. Now, we know that he was in Corinth three years, about three years before he wrote this epistle. So that would be about 47 AD, which if you think about it, is only 17 years after 30. And today scholars date the resurrection to 30 AD. So it means that he visited Corinth about 17 years after the resurrection. And he says, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received. 
So they had a positive response to the gospel. And in which you now stand, through which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believed in vain, unless you've fallen away. And then this is the message. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I had in turn received. And then he goes on and he quotes an early creed. Now the question is, when did he receive this? And again, scholars agree that he would have received this profession of faith at the time when he was converted on the Damascus Road and subsequently as he met with the apostles. That he, they would have taught him, of course he met the risen Christ famously on the Damascus Road when he was blinded by the light. The Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then he sends him to Damascus, to the street called Straight, where there's a man waiting for him to uh, explain to him how Jesus is the Messiah. So Paul goes from being the primary persecutor of the church, a Jew steeped in the traditions of Judaism and of Gamaliel, who to this day is... is PhD supervisor, who to this day is considered one of the few greatest rabbis in Jewish history, and Paul was his star student. Paul is this person who is steeped in um, pharisaical, anti-Christian sentiment and training and tradition, and he does a 180 degree turn, and he becomes the flaming apostle to the Gentiles. And this happens as he receives this message from the apostles. Now, what is the message? So here it is. It goes from verse 3 to verse 7. And scholars today, both secular and Christian and Jewish, consider this to be an early creed that would have been said by Christians at their baptism or that would have been said in a church service, for example. And here it goes. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, that's the Aramaic name for Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are alive, although some have died, and then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, that means born in the wrong time, he appeared also to me. And that's the end of the creed. Now the question is, when did Paul receive this? Well, Paul was converted about three years after the resurrection of Jesus. So he received it in about 33 AD. So then, if this creed was already in existence in around 33 AD, that's three years within the resurrection. Where does it come from? And scholars today say it came probably from within a few months of the resurrection. Now, in, in terms of ancient history, to get agreement like this, from a broad range of scholars, both secular, Jewish, and Christian, about anything is completely unheard of. But there is nothing in ancient history which is as well supported as the life of Jesus and the, the story of the early church. So this is a stunning bit of, bit of information. And there's corroborating evidence. Those scholars who study source criticism have gone over this with a fine tooth comb. And they've noticed certain things about the cadence of the creed and about the words in the creed that indicate that it came from within maybe a year, within a very short time. And one of the clues to that is the name Cephas. Don't, don't miss this. Don't be distracted. This is important. One of the clues to this is the name Cephas because Cephas is Peter's Aramaic name and it's only used in the first year or so of in, in, in documents of the church writing. And it, it dates this creed as being right next to the time when the disciples were still kind of being Aramaic in Jerusalem, doing their Aramaic thing before they went out into the Greek world. So this is a little Aramaic um, remnant. It's an appendix which has come from their fellowship as disciples with Jesus. He called him Cephas, not Peter. The name is Cephas. That means Peter, the rock. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, scholars say uh, that this dates this to probably within a year, maybe a few months of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So it's absolutely stunning. And what this tells us is that 
whether you accept all the detail of the arguments or not, as the scholars do, um, it certainly tells us that the belief in the resurrection did not evolve 400 years later. The belief in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus comes from within a very, very, very short space of time in ancient historical terms. There's, there's no evidence for things like this in the ancient world. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. You're lucky, you know, the, the Queen Boadicea of England. We know about Boadicea because there's one reference that's written hundreds of years after she was alive. And yet, you know, she's on the money, isn't she? She's, she's all over England, you know, Boadicea. History, right? History. But Jesus is so well documented, and we know that the early church, what they believed so early on. So this is not a myth that evolved. Now, this is a very powerful piece of evidence. If hundreds of people believed this so early on, um, what was it, a mass hallucination? Were they, were they all massacres? Did they all want to get killed by the Sanhedrin and the Roman authorities for following a false messiah? You know, what's going on here? These were people, hundreds and hundreds of people, who were in a position to know whether or not it was true. They knew. So, you know, you have martyrs, and martyrs will die for things they believe in, but they don't know whether they're true or not. The people who believe in ancient characters from the past and ancient religious leaders, they don't know if it's really true. They weren't there. But the witnesses to the resurrection were there. They knew whether the, the belief they were living for and dying for and being imprisoned and persecuted and beaten and stoned and put to death for, they knew whether it was true or not. And yet not one of them recanted. There's no evidence of, of early Christian leaders, let alone Christian believers. In fact, not only did they not recant, but we know from Roman letters from the Roman governors uh, around 100, 120 AD, the Romans were killing them like flies. They, they were dying like flies and in terrible ways, because they had confidence in the resurrection of Jesus and in the life to come. And I have a friend now in Australia, uh, Ben, who's a pastor. Um, he's an Anglican. Uh, he became pastor of an independent church in Wimbledon, in London. And Ben developed uh, cancer of the jaw, and he's now dying. He's had it for two years, and he's on his second tumor, and they've tried radiation and immunotherapy and now they're trying chemotherapy, but basically he's dying. And the thing is now very close to his brain and his face is he's a very handsome man. When Ben came here, I took him to show him around Macau as one does. And we saw, what else do you see? The churches and the casinos. And when we walked through the casinos, because he's such a handsome man, it was 10 years ago, um, we were repeatedly propositioned, or at least he was, uh, by women who came up and, and offered themselves to him. Now, this has never happened to me in my life, <laughs> not once. And I was looking at him like, what is it about you, bro? You know? but, but actually, Ben is a very handsome man, and, and now he's lost his good looks. He's, he's 53, so please spare a prayer for him and his wife, Karen. Karen is a nurse that works for the World Health Organization. She was uh, the leader of the team in Africa that was fighting Ebola. So uh, she's a very senior a nurse in the World Health Organization, and they're a wonderful couple, and it's a difficult time for them. But, but my friend, was, uh, Ben, was sharing in a, in a message how confident he is in the resurrection of the body. Christians don't just believe that we will be floating on clouds in spiritual existence. We get this from art. We get it from Michelangelo and from Correggio and from the great artists. Now, they, great, they made great paintings, but they were lousy theologians. And the scriptures tell us again and again that we will be raised bodily and that the world will be remade. There will be earth version two and it will be heaven and we will eat Lord Stowe's egg tarts and have great coffee in heaven and Earl Grey tea, I trust. So the, the first reason that we get from this scripture is that they believe very early on. The second reason to have confidence in the resurrection is that there are so many witnesses Within the space, and these are only some of them that are mentioned in your epistle. Within the space of 40 days, Jesus appears to, to Kephas, to Peter, to the 12. He appears, of course, to the women. Um, typical male chauvinist, I, I don't think the women are mentioned in the epistle, are they? They are in the epistle? No. It's interesting, isn't it? The women are the primary star witnesses of all the major events in Jesus' life. They're always the ones first there to see them. It's very striking um, uh, that God honors the women in this way because at that time, women's testimony was not considered valid in court. 
and women were not considered reliable witnesses. All of that ancient prejudice was very deep. And so it's really striking to me that God chose what the world saw as the least reliable witnesses to be to carry the witness of his resurrection to the world. It was Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, who first arrived and found the tomb empty. And she ran to Peter and said, they have taken the body. And Peter and John run to the tomb. And it says that Peter stopped outside, uh, sorry, Peter, John stopped outside, the beloved disciple he is. Peter rushes in and looks around. And then the gospel says, John went in. And there's this word in the Greek that says he saw and believed. And the word for saw here means to see and understand. Like in English when we say, ah, I see. Like in English you can say, no, I see what you're doing. But you may not see why they're doing it. So what this means is, John went in and he saw, he understood that Jesus had risen. It's a different word. It means he understood and the scripture says he believed. So the, 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 the boys came after, but it was Mary first and the women first who were the witnesses uh, in, in the tomb. They don't get mentioned, but they're still very, very important. Then we have 500 who Paul says to the Corinthians are mostly still alive. So this is written in 50, 20 years after the resurrection. And most of the people who saw Jesus are still kicking around. So he's saying, you can go and ask them, you know, go and talk to them. Then we have James, the brother of Jesus, who also was a non-believer during Jesus' ministry, who also had a 180 degree turnaround and became the leader of the church. Now, that's no small thing. How many of you think you can convince your brother or sister that you are God incarnate? Anybody want to try that? Somehow the resurrection convinced James that his brother, when he saw the risen Lord, that his brother was God incarnate. And James became the leader of the early church and famously was executed by being thrown off the temple and then stoned what was remained of him. We have many other appearances. The appearance to Thomas who wouldn't believe. And Jesus says, put your finger in the hole in my hand. Put your hand in the wound in my side. And of course Thomas doesn't. How gauche would that be? He falls down and says, my Lord... And my God, the disciples in Galilee, the couple on the road to Emmaus, the ascension again and again and again over 40 days. Jesus appears to hundreds and hundreds of witnesses alive and well. This is stunning. And the interesting thing about this is that there are five facts that all 99% of scholars going back 150 years, people have surveyed this. 99% of scholars going back 150 years, secular, atheist, Christian, religious, Jewish, all agree on these five things. Number one, Jesus died a brutal and devastating death at the hands of the Romans by crucifixion. Number two, a few days later, the tomb was empty and the body was missing. Number three, everyone agrees, hundreds of Jesus' disciples believed that he rose and appeared to them alive and well during the following six weeks. That's amazing. Groups of people don't mass hallucinate. There's no such thing. How did this happen? Number four, Paul, the prime persecutor, is turned around and converted. Number five, the skeptic James is turned around and converted. Everybody believes on these things. How do we explain them? Number three, the resurrection converts were all Jewish. Paul, James, and Peter. Now, I lived for a year on Long Island in a Jewish community and I tell you, trying to convert Jews to Christianity is, I never tried really, uh, but it, it, it just, it's, it's so difficult. Uh, why? Because they're profoundly steeped in their identity, their culture, their ethnic identity, their religious identity, and their spiritual identity. To convert a Jew is incredibly difficult. To convert a Muslim. I remember when my friend Joshua Mahdi became a, a Christian. He was a, a Muslim, the son of an imam, in, a Shia imam in Baghdad. And when he left Islam and became a Christian, first of all, he had to hide in the toilet for months, something like four or five months, because his brothers wanted to kill him. And then when they came to break down the door to kill him, as the other imam, the father had died from shock at his conversion, or just after his conversion, so the brothers blamed him for, for that. Uh, when the brothers came to kill him, to wash their shame as the imam called it, his mother wake, woke him up in the night and said, you must flee to Jordan, your brothers are coming to kill you. So that night he left and he never saw his mother again. He left his childhood home, he left his brothers, 
His brothers disown him. They, most of them, not all of them, wanted to kill him. This is the cost for a person from the Middle East of following Jesus. And it's just as hard for a Jew as for a Christian. Despite the fact that the Jewish messianic movement is growing tremendously around the world, and yet in Israel there is still a very tiny percentage of Christians in Israel to this day, and yet there's tremendous encouragement. It's growing, it's growing now at a very lively and rapid rate because of the internet. Up until now, the rabbis have been able to control information about Jesus. They, they call Isaiah 53 the forbidden chapter. The, the Jews are forbidden to read Isaiah 53. Because you read it, it sounds like Jesus. So they, don't, they forbid them from reading it. But you can't forbid people from accessing the internet. And Israelis access the internet more than anyone in the world. So they're coming to Christ. Uh, number four, the early believers were martyred for their faith. You know this argument. It's well known. Why would they die for a lie? The fifth uh, argument about the resurrection being literally true was that it's part of a much bigger plan. And I've preached about this many times, about the way in which Jesus fulfills over 300 Old Testament prophecies, about the way in which we have copies of those documents from before the life of Christ. So we know that the, the prophecies were there, about the way in which the New Testament and Old Testament were transferred incredibly carefully and faithfully. So that when we read the New Testament today um, and we look at the earliest copies that we dig out of the sand from the end of the first century and the early second century, we find that there is absolutely no change except for a few punctuation marks. So we know that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies in the Old Testament. And it's just impossible that any human being should do so, and yet he does. All the Old Testament stories from Jonah to Joshua point to Jesus and the resurrection. Jonah in the whale for three days, coming out to life. Whether it's a parable or literal, it doesn't really matter. It's a metaphor for the resurrection. The Old Testament is full of metaphors of the life of Jesus and the resurrection. He is the most Googled person in history. He has today, to this day... His book is the bestseller every year, year in, year out. He's had more impact on human history than any other person. And shouldn't it be so if he truly was raised bodily from the dead? Now, the hope of the early Christians was that if he was raised from the dead, he said that we too would be raised with him. So that when he returns at the second coming, we will be raised and caught up into heaven to be with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, when you say, well, what about other religions? Well, Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. Moses is dead. Zoroaster is dead. The gurus, all dead. Confucius is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Krishna is dead. The Dalai Lamas are all dead. But Jesus is alive. He has conquered death. He stands out towering over history as the statue towers over Rio. So to close with the gospel, Jesus asks two questions of Mary, and they're questions that he asks of you today. We need hope in times of COVID, in times of pandemic, in times of family crisis and trial and stress and difficulty and unemployment as people are facing around the world. And Jesus comes to us and he says, woman or man, I love how he says that, woman, why are you weeping? Man, why are you weeping? What is the source of your sorrow? What is the source of your pain? What is your need? He comes to her and says, what is it you need? What is it that grieves you? And then he says, and whom are you looking for? What do you need to meet that need? What do you need to ease your pain? What do you need to ease your grief? And here there is the hope of resurrection power. That God is always able to work, even in the darkest night, even in the most difficult situation. We believe that God was working it behind the situation. Mary was so caught up in her tears, she couldn't recognize him. She couldn't imagine that this was the risen Christ. She thought he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you had taken his body... Show me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus just says one word. Calls her name, Mary. And in that instant, her, the question is, 
answered, who are you looking for? She's looking for him. He is alive. I really believe that Jesus is what we need, that he is the source of our hearts. He is the, the balm for our broken hearts. He is the hope God can work, even in the difficult situation. And I wanted to say in my sermon, this side of death, that God can even, of course, we believe, work the other side of death. That he is able to raise us up to eternal life. Even death poses no obstacle to the resurrection power of God. This is the hope we have. So I invite you to talk to Jesus in your prayers this morning. Tell him that you believe in him. Tell him that you love him. And he is asking you, why are you weeping? And whom or what do you seek? And I invite you to bring your need to him who has all power even to rise from the dead. May we take a moment of silent prayer as we bring our needs and our griefs and our prayers to the one who has all power and all dominion and all authority and in him who in him there is still hope even when the night seems darkest. May the Lord bless you and may he hear our cry. This morning, um, I'd like to just credit um, that the outline for the first part of the sermon, these are arguments I've shared many times in school and, and here, but this particular way of putting them together comes from my friend Ben, who is dying from cancer. So I would like to dedicate this message to Ben since I've stolen his sermon outline. Uh, not the last bit from Mary Magdalene, but and uh, pray that Ben, that the Lord will bless you and uh, give you peace, and Karen also. Amen. May we be together in heaven. Dear friends, let us turn to the prayer book, and we will stand with the church throughout the world as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We declare together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, who became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear friends, let us please kneel or be seated as you feel comfortable. And Anya will lead us in our intercessions this morning. Um, good morning. So um, prayers are based on Form 1, but there's no need to follow any book. Just close your eyes and answer in your heart. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer as appropriate. So as we marvel today at the extent of God's love for us, I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world who celebrate the fulfillment of God's promise. We pray for bishops. Pray for our priest, 
for all Sunday school teachers, especially our Sunday school helper, Grace, who spends every weekend making the magic of Sunday school happen. Lord, these folks are a rock, and we thank you for their service. We pray that you bless them with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and keep in good health. Friends, I ask your prayers for Christians who suffer for their faith in countries that don't welcome Jesus. We pray that the borders open soon so that Christian solidarity and annual can resume their ministry to them. Friends, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. The wisdom of those in power who, who distribute the COVID vaccines, for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to distribute them and distribute them fairly with compassion for those who cannot afford it. We pray for our leaders. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the unemployed, those in prison suffering from COVID and family disturbances. We especially pray for the victims of the train crash in Taiwan and their families, for those in our congregation that we know and love, for Alice, for Chloe and Christine, and those we don't know so well who are asking our prayers through the bulletin, especially the little boy Joseph who's fighting cancer. Please pray that these people find the strength and comfort and healing in the risen Lord, and that his victory inspires them to put their trust in God. We pray for all those who suffer. <clears throat> I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper <coughs> knowledge of him. Please pray for the friends who will be coming to the 11 o'clock service and those who will be baptized today. Pray that they, may, that they may be found and find God through Jesus. Pray that Jesus brings, them, brings back those who have drifted away. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially those who passed away after suffering from COVID that they may find peace with God. Friends, praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. We give thanks for our growing ministries and small groups and pray that we may glorify God in our daily life and that we may be worthy of Christ's sacrifice. Friends, I ask your prayers for each other, that we may meet here every Sunday in good health and live with full hearts. And I ask your thanksgiving for all the children and teenagers in our church and their growth in faith. May it continue uninterrupted and pray that they don't miss the message amidst the games and celebrations today. And finally, take a minute to pray for all your individual needs and give thanks for all your answered prayers. Amen, and thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Look not upon our sin, but upon the faith of your church. And give to us the peace and unity of the heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forevermore. Amen. Dear friends, we turn to page six. As we prepare our hearts to break bread together, hear the word of the Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law 
and the prophets. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor in the words of this corporate confession as we pray, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, Lord, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have done. We have Dear friends, may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sin through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May we stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Please be seated for just a moment, friends. Um, do please stay for morning tea um, after the service. And um, if anyone feels moved uh, to come to the second service and see the baptisms, of course, we're all one parish. Uh, you're most welcome to come and enjoy the baptism and um, encourage the folks being baptized today. Also, we have our two praise uh, teams. The children's praise dance team will be dancing a resurrection song. And the teens uh, will also be uh, dancing a praise resurrection song uh, at the second service. So there's some special things happening there this morning. Uh, we couldn't fit the dance in here, I'm afraid. You, <laughs> some of you will be pleased to know. Um, this afternoon, the Philippine Fellowship is in uh, all, the, all the Filipino and migrant worker friends. And in fact, anybody who'd like to go to a picnic is warmly invited um, to gather about 3 p.m. Um, 3-ish p.m. at the volleyball area at Haksa Beach. Um, and the invitation is please bring a dish of food to share for picnic and some water. The ladies are organizing three dishes and some drinks, but everyone is invited to bring a dish to share for the picnic and, um, and uh, water because it's hot and humid. And there's going to be games, Easter egg hunt, sack race, egg hunt, egg relay, toss the egg, crack the egg, and so, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So uh, do please come. And uh, in fact, I, I think that uh, Miss Donna is a contact person. So if you'd like to know anything, please see Donna after the service. Um, we, uh, I commend to you all of the notices this morning. And there was one other thing I needed to mention. Um, if you have joined the church in the last year, our welcome team at the second service would like to or organize a dim sum lunch for people who've joined the church in the last year to welcome them and enable them to meet uh, some of the, the church members and leaders in, in a more relaxed setting. So if you'd like to join the dim sum lunch, it'll be on Sunday the 25th of eight, April at 2 p.m. Uh, it's on, the notice is on page nine. So if you want to sign up for that, please let me know um, and be our guest if you've joined the church in the last year. Let us stand and we will sing our offertory hymn and I commend all the notices to you. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 261, I Am the Bread of Life. Let us stand and sing. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall not thirst. No one who comes to me, unless the Father draw me, and I will raise him up, and I will. 
Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. We pray together, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Charlie, I'm darling, can you stand with Daddy, please? It's a little bit distracting what we are. Thank you. It's all right. We love you, but... It's a little bit distracting for me. Thank you. Let us turn to page nine. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God. Confident to pray, 
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do invite you as always, if you are baptized in any Christian tradition and believe in Christ as your Savior, to join with us at his table in communion today. I also can announce that the Archbishop has allowed us to have the wine again, but we would ask you to dip the bread in the cup to practice intinction rather than drinking from the cup uh, at this time. the body of Christ keep you in the body of Christ keep you in the body of Christ keep you in the body of Christ 
Friends, let us turn to page 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not hold on to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. May we pray as we give thanks for these mysteries, saying together, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection I commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us stand and sing our, our closing hymn. If we can sing it at a good, joyful pace, moving along. 689. Thine be the glory. It's a victory song. Thine be the glory.
Hallelujah. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Christ is risen. Benoida is here. <laughs> Send them to, to me. Those and those, they are just beautiful. That as well. Send them to me, will you? That's great, mate. <laughs> that is fantastic. Chris. Morning, Marlene. Nice to see you. Morning, Miss Dyer. Oh, you're still going. All right. Lovely. Hello, everybody. Michael, how are you?